of the foundations of Toastmasters is speech evaluations. They're one of the fastest routes to growth. Feedback is important not only to point out what we can improve on, but also to remind us of what we do well. Without these reminders, we might stop repeating those positive actions. Today, you're in for a real treat, an opportunity to supercharge your speeches with feedback from accomplished Toastmasters from District 40. If you're so inclined, you can step on stage here, share a portion of your speech or your story or a presentation that you're working on, and pick up an on-the-spot assessment. Your evaluations will be delivered from three <coughs> Toastmasters who bring their own unique perspective. One is an actor, one is a humorist, and one is wearing costume many days after Halloween. Has <laughs> to kick off our speech evaluation session, please help me welcome Toastmaster, who is an author, presentation skills consultant, and professional speaker. He's also been in our organization longer than some of you have been alive. Our MC for today's event, Michael Davis, your public speaking MC. All right, let's just get it out of the way. I am not dressed like this because I'm attending the procrastinator's Halloween party tonight. Not why I'm the story behind this, and I've known many of you a long time, is that back in 2008, I started my company, Speaking CPR. And the reason I chose that name is because the name Michael Davis, kind of ordinary. I checked the roster. There are 58 people in this building right now named Michael Davis. <laughs> So I said, I had to come up with something new. People love the speaking CPR. The tagline is giving life to business presentations and stories. Two years after that, a friend of mine sat down with me and said, you know, you're missing something. Your initials are MD. Why don't you become the speaking MD to go along with your company name? And I took that idea and I sat on it for seven years. <laughs> Because I had this voice in my head giving me all this stupid advice. Don't do that. You'll look ridiculous. People will make fun of you. They'll think you're arrogant. God, all this stuff was in my head. Until last May, the National Speakers Association meeting, a marketing genius pulled me aside, said, what's your story? Gave her the background of the company, and she said, any other ideas? And I said, well, I got this idea, speaking MD. That's great. Are you using it? No. She said, you're nuts. She was from New York, very laid back. <laughs> she said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go buy the coat. You're going to buy the stethoscope. You're going to become the speaking MD. And she made me do promise in front of 40 of my peers. So this is why I'm here today. She made me do it. Now, I told you that story for a reason, not to talk about my business, but that for seven years, I had this voice in my head that said, don't do it. You've got all these reasons. The same voice that may often be in your head when you're testing a new speech. You've got a new idea, a story, but something is holding you back. This session is designed to do live coaching. We want you to step in front of your peers and get feedback from myself and my two buddies. Whatever the voice says, I want you to ignore it. Come up here. This is an opportunity to get especially feedback from two of the best that District 40 has to offer. Speaking of which, you may know them, you may not. Now it's time to introduce my friends because a good doctor never tries to do it on his own or her own. Our first co-coach is someone I've known for nine years. He is a humorist. He's one of the funniest people I know, but see, he has to be a humorist because of the tragedy of his life. See, he's been for 50 years a Cleveland sports fan. <laughs> and with one slight exception, every year they break his heart, year after year after year, and he's had to become a humorist. Please help me welcome my friend, Phil Barth. <laughs> now, what qualifies Phil to be here in 2011? He was one of the final 10 speakers in the International World Championship of Public Speaking. What year? 2011. In 2015, I believe he would have been there again if not for a pesky little heart attack. 
one week before the event, which is really why I'm dressed this way today. If there was any problems, I'm there. Our second co-presenter today is one of the best evaluators. I've watched this man grow from, from speaker to one of the better evaluators in our district. He gives such unique perspective on speeches. I wanted different perspectives when we put this program together. Three-time district champion, right? Twice humorous. Mm -hmm. yes. And he stole my trip to Kuala Lumpur in 2014 when I finished second in the district. But it was well earned. It's, it's a speech that I still think about today. Help me welcome my friend David Levy. Here's why we, we put this program together. In 2013, the International Convention was here. My friend Darren LaCroix, who's a previous world champion, and five other world champions, did, that's four, that's five, did a program where they had people line up and they gave them on-the-spot evaluations. And it worked so well, I thought, let's do that here. Okay, none of us is a world champion. He was there close. He flew to Kuala Lumpur and, and actually finished behind the guy who eventually won, and I think about it a lot. So, <laughs> here's how this works. We want you to come to the front of the room. I'll have you give us a quick overview of what your speech is. I want a short, specific, kind of what you're trying to get. Don't make your description as long as your speech. I've heard that happen before. And at any point, we may stop you. Any one of the three of us may stop you and give you feedback on the spot. Oh, by the way, just a, a kind of a piece of business order. If you need to go to the restroom, <laughs> right down there. <laughs> and we're getting a rope so you can rappel down. I will move back up. Spider will help you. That's why he's there. All right. So we're going to take volunteers. We're not going to make anybody do this, but if you've got a speech, a story, even an idea that you're working on, we would love you to come All to the right. front. We have a volunteer. Well, come right. to the front of the room, please. It's um, inspirational. Inspirational speech. Number so, nine. Number nine, okay. So this could be outside of Toastmasters? Yes. Okay. Again, now, keep in mind, at any point we may stop you. It is to help you. This is not just for the people in front of the room, by the way. It is for you, because we see certain tendencies in Toastmasters speeches that we, we, if you're doing something well, we're going to tell you. If there's something we want you to stop and consider something, so, here's how we're going to do this with every speaker. We're not going to do the long applause. I know we're used to that in Toastmasters. When I say the name, you say, here's Carla. We're going to do this. So, let's practice. All right. Here's Carla. Great. All right. So, here's... Yes, if, Bill. If you would like to give some feedback to Carla, put it on a piece of paper and hand it in. Hand it to her. So, we can, you can get up to 30 pieces of feedback. Now. Say! Absolutely. <laughs> we're, we're, keep in mind, these are three different opinions. <laughs> Doesn't mean they're right or wrong, just different things for you to think about. So, with that in mind, what's your speech title if you have one? Renew Your Life. Renew Your Life. And we may cut you off at any certain point. All right, ready? Here's Carla. How many times have you been out enjoying yourself, having a good time? You meet your friend and you say, Hi, how are you? And they let loose the vilest <laughs> welcome you have ever seen in your life. How do you Stop. feel? So far, like what I'm hearing, right? Mm -hmm. I want to hear more pausing in there. Okay. You ask a very good question, and then you're, boom, you're on to the next point. So ask your question and stop. Okay. How long should you stop? I will tell you, in Toastmasters or practice, go much longer than you would in a regular speech. There's something in athletics called muscle memory. Mm -hmm. When you start to create muscle memory for pausing, it will feel more comfortable. So I want you to start over, and when you ask a really good question, pause, 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 set the scene for the story you did, and then pause, let us think about it. David, as, and both of you guys as humor experts, don't you see one of the biggest problems is we, we don't let people laugh because we don't stop? Mm -hmm, yes. For sure. Did you say bile-less? Bile-less. Bile so a negative Very reaction. Bile. Vile. It may be, that's it. I want to see, it doesn't have to quite be like that. <laughs> I want your body and your face and your voice to okay. mirror the word. 
so that in case I don't quite catch the word, I get it's a negative one. Okay. Most so, vile. Even, uh, well, we'll have some grammarians in the audience here for your, for your pleasure. <laughs> but yeah, that, that too. Yeah. And here's another way to play it. To be the person when you meet them. So you, you say, hello, how are you doing? And they say, oh, I've got arthritis, precise, polite. And go into a, a 10 second rant about you. Yeah, and can you believe what so and so did? And, and so actually play it and make a dialogue. I like that idea, Phil. You could also, and they said to you, blankety, 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 blankety. Ooh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? <laughs> All right. Sorry, so, I asked. want you to do it now. Yeah. Here's the thing when you're doing this, because Carla's kind of our test, our, our, our guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> when we've given you all this feedback, be careful. That's a lot at one time. This is being recorded, by the way. Hopefully, we'll get copies of it so you can go back over. But you're going to start thinking about it. That's okay. This is the place to experiment. And as I like to say, screw up. It's okay. All right, so let's try it again. Let's reintroduce Carla. Have you ever woke up one day and had an amazing morning? Then you go out and you meet your friend Sarah. Good morning, Sarah. How are you? What are you so happy about? This is not a good morning. This morning sucks. My eggs are running. But bacon didn't come out right. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> most vile information in the welcome you have ever received. What do you do? Stop. That was fantastic. Yeah. Did you see the difference? <laughs> I really like the part where you plan the phone and the pen coming. I don't know. <laughs> Did you see the difference in energy? She took David's suggestion and she went for Phil's idea and just started letting the word spew. You know? One other idea to think about is when we have conversations, I see this a lot in speaking, we'll do, there's a lot of movement, okay? And there's travel between characters. Here's a, when we have an argument with someone or we're listening, do we move around a lot or we, Robert, but stand in place. See how, you, see how Robert reacted to just pretending? Is <laughs> that's putting people in the scene? When you're when you're changing characters, don't do this. That's not realistic. Just do a 45 degree shift of your feet. I'm you. I'm gonna be really, that's too bad, Don. I'm just gonna hear that. It's it's quicker and it doesn't. It's it's subtle, but it disrupts the flow when there's that extra movement. Want to try it one more time? How did that feel? <laughs> I liked it personally because that might happen to somebody who's really mad. Hey, think about, does, would this really happen in real life? Yeah, if somebody was mad enough, it could. So how did it feel the second Good. time? Good. Okay, now it's gonna be even better. All right, well, let's, one more time with Carla. Have you ever woke up and had the most amazing day ever? Then you walk outside and you meet your friend Sarah. Good morning, Sarah, how are you? What is so good about this morning? It's horrible, my bacon was burnt, I lost my coffee, ah, uh, this is horrible morning. Okay. <coughs> <laughs> what do you do? Well, if you are thinking, don't take it personally, you are on the right path. Today, we're gonna to talk about the four agreements and renewing your life. Great. Are you interested in what she has to say next? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't that the purpose of a good opening? Yes. Absolutely. Carla, I'll add one thing Absolutely. to the, as far as this opening goes, Carla, this is about renewing your life. I'd like to hear a little coda on that story meeting with Sarah about how draining that can be. Or, or maybe something's wrong with Sarah. She's, her perspective is off. I need to understand what renewing your life has to do with this encounter with Sarah. It doesn't quite make sense to me yet, and it could be a long time before it does. Just a couple of words to, it's either about you as the listener who's got energy drainers in your life, or it's Sarah as the person who's down who needs to change her perspective, and that's, one of and, the two. And yes, and that, that's it, because the focus is don't pick up other people's garbage and make it your garbage. 
and then mess up your life. I'm yeah, write I, that down. Since it could be either one of those two things, I definitely need a little helping hand at the beginning to understand which one it is. And, and my thought was, after you say, what do you do? Give a couple of examples, which plays right into that. Mm -hmm. Do you do you <coughs> smack her in the face? Do you walk away? Do you say, that's the kind of things reserved for Facebook? Or, or do you say, and then the, the, whatever those first examples are, I'm just joking with those, the, no, the last one is, or do you let it ruin your day? See, that's why I asked them to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Can I offer something? Uh, what hit me is I don't ever recall that ever happening to me, so I'm not hooked, and in fact, I'm kind of wondering, do I want to listen anymore? So I don't know. The, the opening has some, for me, some issues that perhaps need some kind of change. Well, and the one that he said about don't let it ruin your day makes it hook. Because things do happen that hook your day. Maybe that didn't happen to me. Yeah, it, it could be. Can you make it a little more universal? Like, for example, when you said, uh, and then you run into your friend Sarah. You might want to just... Usually you want to include names and stories, but this is one case where it makes it too specific and you might push me out of the story. You run into somebody who's having a bad day and they're trying to infect your day. I think there is a way to use that effectively, humorously, when a person starts telling a hypothetical story and then they include so many specifics that it's clear they're talking about a problem of their own, mm -hmm. then it, you have a lot of humor you can milk out of that. So I would say that it's halfway in that direction, so either make it more about a real encounter that you had, uh, or make it more hypothetical for everybody's purposes and, and keep everybody engaged or, or milk it for the humor. Right. You run into your husband, okay. I mean, you run into Sarah, okay, really, your husband? <laughs> so everybody doesn't have a yeah. husband. Question. Or it could be as simple as, and then I checked Facebook, and that could, everyone's mind will go to whatever their drama and drama on Facebook is. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be that specific. I was having a wonderful day, and then I checked Facebook. And that's enough. I mean, if you pause right there, everybody's going to go. Yeah. And six hours later, when I logged on. <laughs> <laughs> There's a million ways you could skin this yeah. cat. So, yeah. Yeah. Carl, was that painful at all? No. Good. Who's next? All right. What? Okay, what type of story or speech is this? Inspirational. Inspiration. So it could be used outside of Toastmasters. Yes. All right. We're going to do the same thing. At any point, you may be stopped. Ready? Help me introduce. Oh, title, if there is one. And you don't have to have one. You get what you think about. You get what you think about. All right, everybody. You get what you think about. Here's Linda. At one of the lowest absolutely lowest points in my life, a friend asked me to teach a class called The Intentional Family. I thought I was the worst person to teach this class because I'd just been divorced. Not only that, my four children were living with their father. So what was I going to tell parents about The Intentional Family? Stop. One quick change. Instead of saying you're narrating what you thought, right. I thought, why would they pick me? I I've just gone through a divorce. My four kids are with my husband. Why me? And so you're you're going through you're you're letting people into your thought process and making them part of the story. Yes, anytime when you go back over your stories and speeches, the written version, ask yourself this question. Is this narration can it be turned into dialogue <clears throat> dialogue puts you in the scene think about carla with sarah did you feel like you were right there that's what dialogue does it brings it to life it pulls you in so again you're going to have to think about it a little bit but let's start it again and dave any thoughts yet yes i'd like to i personally would love to hear a, more of a pictorial description of you in this scene I can imagine you in your robe at 10 a.m. with a bag of chips and and your hair a mess or something like like show us how 
dismal you're feeling. You're talking about being at the lowest point in your life. That's got to translate in some physical way or some house-related mess way or some fashion that you could describe instead of being so uh, uh, specific about it. Uh, I wouldn't mind hearing two even more specifics. In 2010, I was freshly divorced. My four children had chosen or whatever to were living with their father and I was a wreck and the phone rang. You know, I, I just want to sort of be able to picture in my mind an image of the phone ringing next to you. I just, that'll help make it stick for me better. And, and he hit on something that, that consider including, like Cheetos for breakfast or something. Breakfast with Cheetos and vanilla ice cream or something like that. Because you want, you, you got to paint the picture, but at the same time, you don't want to just paint, bring everybody down all the, all the way, right? So. If you watch sitcoms, you know, even when something's bad, all of a sudden somebody will come up with something to bring the audience back up a little bit. So you can weave in a little bit of humor. Obviously, it's not a humorous moment, but at least, you know, if, if breakfast was Cheetos and ice cream or whatever, you can, that, that'll get people to laugh and break it, and then you can go back into the story. <laughs> One of the best pieces of advice I've ever been given came from a gentleman named Michael Haig. Michael is a Hollywood scriptwriting consultant. And he said, rather than do a lot of narration about a character, talk about how that character is dressed and also how that person enters a room. That will give you so much insight. So to go back to the advice you just got, Linda, you're dressed in a way that would reflect how you're feeling in that moment. Talk about editing on the fly. <laughs> is this painful? <laughs> I've never been this nervous in my life. Yeah. This is, it doesn't get any worse than this. <laughs> this is where you get loving feedback. I'll say too that I think we just asked you to add additional vulnerability to your story, to yeah. be even more honest in that specific moment. This is an inspirational speech in which you're going to use your experience to uplift other people. I feel like, and if you're don't, not ready to do it today, that's cool, but I think being vulnerable is going to give the audience the understanding of you're coming from a point where your experience is valuable to them, so it makes you more credible. Again, if you're not ready to go there today, by all means, but something to think about. Yeah. One other piece of advice, and I'll, I'll let you get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> Craig Valentine, if you know his name, former world champion of public speaking. One of the, another terrific piece of advice he gave me is the place you don't want to go in your life that's where you need to go. Mm -hmm. That is what will impact the audience the most. Just following up on Dave's comment. Mm -hmm. uh, don't have to make all those changes at once, but just kind of play with it, edit it on the fly. All right, here is Linda. Last week I was a soccer mom. Four kids in four different soccer fields. Dinner on the table at six o'clock. But this week, I'm divorced, and my children are living with their father. I haven't changed clothes in three days. I'm wearing the same sweats that I did three days ago. And breakfast is my favorite, Baskin and Robbins pralines and cream. Got it. <laughs> I didn't think I could get much lower than this, and then the phone rang. Linda, I need you to teach a class. You've taught many classes for me before. Well, what class do you want me to teach? The intentional family. Why would you want me to teach the intentional family? I don't even have one anymore. Just teach the book and trust the process. So I did. Stop. What do you think? Oh. With our apologies, we had things, a different instruction. For when you get a natural breaking point, Ball Creek A is set up in rounds. It's set up for the dance tonight, but it's a much bigger room and you might be more comfortable in there. Is it, which direction? Uh, where's the room? Ball Creek A is the first room around to the left down here. Do you want to do it now? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think the majority has won. Do we have, to have her call you and say, Linda, I need your help. What do you want? I need this. 
any answer. So uh, this gets to be a little, it's distracting, but you're on the right path as far as you're not doing this. Yeah. And you're not you're hanging up me. either. You hung up the phone like this. <laughs> I don't know right. if you noticed. We do this. Um, if we're getting that kind of picky, I'm like, oh, she hung up the phone. I'm like, oh, my God. So it was like 20 years ago, it turns out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no yeah, cell phones. OK. Now, here's the, this is a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up, Francisco. Sometimes we have to take liberties with facts. Yes, it was 20 years ago. But a lot of people in the audience, <laughs> younger than us, uh -oh. they will be like, what, what was all that? <laughs> So, <laughs> you know what? Don't even, don't even end it. Just say. Ah, <laughs> uh, there you go. To avoid the confusion, don't even show hanging it up. Just yeah. go on. Yeah. Because that's not a critical part. Right. So, improvement. Yeah. Got a handful sweat about titles in the beginning. Don't. Do you agree, gentlemen, that sometimes a title will leap out at you at the very end? And I've seen titles change yeah. the last one, so that's one. So here's Jeannie with no title. Being born with hand deformities has had its challenges. But the funny thing is, the things people thought I would struggle with, you know, the physical things, climbing the monkey bars, riding a bike, or something as simple as writing. I did those tasks with ease in my own way. But it was the emotional part that was difficult. As a young child, I was often found with my hands in my pockets and my face toward the floor, trying to avoid the questioning looks, the teasing, and the embarrassment. Picture this, Jeannie, a lot shorter if you can imagine that, <laughs> on the middle school playground. We discovered static electricity that day. We discovered that if one kid would slide down the slide, holding tight to the sides, that they would build up enough static electricity that as the kids in the bottom, who had pinkies linked together, would all receive a small static shock after the person on the slide touched them. We were amazed and didn't realize at the time that we were learning more about science than our science teacher was teaching us. <laughs> And of course, my young mind, I wanted to be involved. I thought it was so neat. So I ran up to the group, and I linked pinkies with the person next to me. And I was having a blast until another girl came in and decided she wanted to get in on this experiment as well. She looked down in order to grab my pinky, saw that I was missing a few digits, and ran away screaming. That memory will forever be etched in my mind. She was afraid of me because of something that I couldn't control. And I remember thinking, if this is the way everyone's going to react to this, why would I ever want to show anyone? Stop. Good. Right. Yep. Right. Sorry, I'm going to do it already. <laughs> earlier just to say I've got no reason to stop you. This is a very, very well-formed speech. This scene around the bottom of the slide, I need to, if you said what grade you were in or how old you were, I don't remember it, it might bear repeating. It's very important to understand how formative this was. If you were 17 at the time, then presumably you've had encounters prior to that. So this is an early, early example. I want to know how old you are. I also would encourage you to sort of work on this description of how this is laid out. There's just something about it. Like you running and joining the end of this thing that's already happening. At first I thought you were involved in it, and then you joined it, so that was a little confusing. You jumped onto the end of it. Anything you could do, this is such a formative moment that this is where the majority of the detail in your speech belongs. And it had the majority of the detail in your speech. This is where you're allowed to pause and take the most time. I have a picture in my head of children holding pinkies around the bottom of the slide. You've done a great job of putting that in my head. I've never seen it before, and now I'll never forget it. But concentrate on that area. You can make it even more impactful. I just absolutely need to kind of understand where you are in your life. I was on the same track with David. The one thing I thought was, 
I don't know the age, you said it's for a younger audience. And he's, it's the same age as you were at the time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I was going to say, when I was your age, that maybe, or maybe come up with the number. And then, and then put them in the, are they going to be older than you were at the time? Uh, yes. I'm, okay. I'm thinking high school. Okay. So, so think back to when you were on the playground. There's a group of us all together, we're all holding paint. So put them in the scene. They're in there too. And then, I want to join in with you guys. And then you go out and rest the scene. And that's just a little bit of a outstanding story. Yeah, the emotions here. This is the hardest part for most speakers is how do I make emotions? You got that. We want to create more of a scene. We're going to get in Dave's world of acting for a moment. If you use the stage to, to, to talk about the kids on the slide, Anchor that scene here. Have yourself over here, and don't tell us, oh, I want to do that too. And you go over and say, hey, can I join in? And then describe the blinking of the pinky. So you're back over here in this part. And then the other girl comes from over there. You pull out your finger. <coughs> she looks at your hand. She runs screaming off. I don't want to hear you say a word after that. Let us see your face and how much of that hurt you. Sometimes the words we use actually hurt the emotion of the scene. Let us see it. There is, I can't remember his name, he's a Hall of Fame speaker. He says, don't retell it, relive it. Relive that scene. So again, this is more state. You've got the emotion, just kind of play with the scene, the speaking area a little bit. So let's do it again. Can I suggest one more Absolutely. thing about this story? The approaching the line and joining the end of it is almost a distraction. Because I think that's the moment when something's about to happen. You were excluded and you were trying to get included. I'm thinking, uh-oh, here it comes. But it's not. It's the next moment. So it's a little bit of a red herring. I'm, I'm waiting, I'm getting a little tense. And I don't necessarily think it's uh, the good kind of getting tense. Uh, like a building story. I would almost just say, we were all having a ton of fun. I was on the end. And just be a part of it already. Skip the part about joining it. Just, I was on, we were all having a good time. I was on the end. And then up came Sarah. Well, <laughs> Sarah's going to be our nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's, can I join you? Sarah. Okay. Okay. With the contrary opinion. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you can do with it. If this was really how it happened, was you were you, you, you pause before you go out there, right? And you want to think: Is this something I really want to do? Do I want to put myself out there? There's a little bit of a struggle, so you decide to do it, and then what happens? Boom. Yeah. So if there was that struggle, you know, and you finally put yourself out there, then what you? Yeah. Uh, so it's either play. add more to it or take it out. It's, it's either a distraction or it needs more embellishment. So I'm the tie-breaking judge. <laughs> Here's what it is. This is the beauty of our organization. Test it. Yep. Go try it one way, go try it the other. And you can ask, and I know a lot of Toastmasters don't know this, when you give your manual to an evaluator, say, this is exactly what I'm looking for, nothing else. How did you react to this scene and start to get the <laughs> Test it. Two great ideas to see what works best for you. One question I have before you start again. When you see the final product of this, Speech, story, presentation, how long is it? 30 minutes, an hour? I can adjust it. Um, I don't like making it five to seven, but I can, but mm -hmm. it's more suited for 30 to an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. All right, let's try it again. Now, Jimmy, wait. <laughs> don't cram yourself into a five or seven. Tell, ask somebody, can I have two slots on the agenda? If you want to practice 15 minutes of it. And this goes for a five to seven minute contest speech. The first time it doesn't have to be five to seven. You're going to want to let the Toastmaster know ahead of time that, look, I've got 10 minutes of material. I want to know what works. So my time will be eight to 10 on this. It won't fit into a manual. But don't let the manual confine you. If you've got 15 minutes that you want to practice, tell them ahead of time, I'd like 15 minutes. Remember, mess with age. The mess can be as long as you need it to be. Communicate that to the Toastmaster and then start to move away. All right, now, before we start again, Jeannie, here's Jeannie. I can remember it as if it were yesterday. A group of third graders staring up at a giant slide with one little third grader at the top. We had discovered static electricity that day. As one child would go down the slide holding on to the sides, they realized that they could build up enough static electricity to shock or electrocute 
every little third grader with linked pinkies at the bottom of the slide. Looking at this event taking place, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a part of it. As I said before, I was often found with my hands in my pockets, and I wouldn't be able to keep my hands in my pockets for this one. But I decided that having fun was worth this experiment. So I joined, and I had a blast doing it, until Sarah decided she wanted to join. She came up and was about to link pinkies with me, and I reached out, and she took one look at my less than fully formed pinky and ran away screaming. I didn't know what to do at that moment, because I realized that maybe it wasn't the greatest idea taking my hands out of my pockets. Maybe my pockets is where they belong, because if people look at my hands and they don't like what they see, what's the point of sharing that? But the funny thing is, my dad always told me that whenever I was in an awkward situation, or I didn't feel confident, or people were making fun of me, that I just needed to laugh along with them. Let me fast forward a little bit. Now we're in high school. So, sorry, the laugh along with them is sounds like it's going to be a great message that ends up being sort of the solution to overcoming your shyness about your hands, as promoted by people like Sarah. That was a very quick leap to the word how humor helped you, because we didn't have like an example of something funny that happened that, that was a segue into it. So it sounded a little disconnected. Imagine all of a sudden you're the new chapter, and we're going to start there. Uh, just an opportunity to play with some rhetoric. This was a science experiment with static electricity, and you were also conducting an experiment to see if you could play okay. along. And that experiment was successful and a failure. So there's probably some wordplay you can get with the two experiments going on at the same time. Fast forward comes this yeah, you're, you, okay. you went back in time, so you, to your audience, you went okay. back. You went forward, but to your audience, you got to remember okay. it shifts. America, Western audiences, it's left. Right. right. Now, I realize we're giving a lot. Is this terrible? A little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not for us. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. Okay. But the point is, we want you to be nervous because it means you care. There's a lot we're giving you here. Still want you to think about, you know, think about what Phil said earlier. Separate yourself from that scene where you really want to join, but I don't know. We want you in isolation over here because it demonstrates how alone you probably felt at times. Then you come over, you take the risk of joining the group. You're actually in, and then it happens where Sarah rejects you. <laughs> Just one little thing. When you say less than fully formed hands, I think of that and I think that's a lot, that's a mouthful. Um, and maybe this is a nit, but I think of what I have, how I only have one eye, I think of being deformed. I think just that one word, I think it has a lot more impact than less than fully formed hands. So, that's my thought. Find a phrase that works for you. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that pause is so important. And she's got a couple points there that the pause would really go a long way. Allow some of that emotion to settle in the arms. Insert those in. Here's what I, whenever I coach somebody, I say go way overboard in your rehearsal and practice. I'm talking five to ten second pauses. Dan Blaney, who was legendary in District 40, was one of my first mentors. Mm -hmm. And I asked Dan one day, I said, How long should you pause? He said, Pause until it hurts. <laughs> and then add a second. It, it's going to be uncomfortable, but this is where you want to be uncomfortable. Because I mentioned before the term muscle memory in athletics, your muscles get used to a certain action over and over. Pausing, when you go way overboard in rehearsal, when you're in front of your audience, your paying audience, you'll go back to a normal place, but it'll still be there. And that's a great point. So much emotion in the speech, let us feel it with you. Speaking of feeling it with you, the, <coughs> that joining in moment, the more excited you are playing that up, the more devastating it is. <coughs> you pull your finger out and she runs on screen. 
And by saying, until Sarah came along, you're kind of projecting what's about to happen. So I decided to join in. And I linked pinkies with the next person. <laughs> and I felt the shock. Oh my god, this is so much fun. And then Sarah came up. And I held out my hand. That's when she ran out to Like, the higher up you are, the more devastating this moment becomes. Dave, what do you think of Sarah is excited until? Hi, Sarah. How's it going? Sure, sure. Yeah, so Sarah should be too. You're adding dialogue. I mean, like, there's a whole lot of ways we could sort of yeah. skin it. Contrast yeah. creates deeper emotional connections. <laughs> the more excited you are, to Dave's point, and the bigger the devastation. And that also lends to the reliving it. Okay. You know, that you really, if you look like you're experiencing those emotions that you had as a child, as you're telling the story, you're reliving it. And then we don't just understand it, we empathize with it. Okay. That's you do. Conversation, ask yourself this question. Is this how I really would say that? If I was eight years old, what I have said, my heart was filled with so much pain and anguish. No, we wouldn't, I'm would exaggerating, obviously. We wouldn't talk that way. So ask yourself, how would this character really say it in that moment? It makes it more believable. All right, who's next? by myself, I am very uncomfortable in front of or even involved with a group of other people, especially if I don't know them very well. I've become part of the college and career group at my church, and we have this outing. We're going to go have fun. It's going to be a whole day. When I first arrive at the church, I see this young lady. She is gorgeous. I want to meet this person. I mean, I'm single. You know, I'm looking for my prospective mate someday. I want to have a good time. And I can just imagine myself the rest of my life with this beautiful woman. I can't help staring at her the entire day. And unbeknownst to me, everybody else around me can't help notice that I'm <laughs> noticing this guy. <laughs> it's all these new friends that I have made today. Somehow they worked it out so that on the bus ride home, which was going to take about an hour, the only seat left on the bus was right next to this beautiful woman. Thanks. Got a great picture in my head of the scene. I can imagine if I was there what it would look like. It's probably different than the real scene, but you've provided enough detail. This is clearly, as far as an open house 
speech for Toastmasters, a story about overcoming introversion. And yet, I've only heard one instance of you saying you're an introvert, which is at the beginning when you said, I'm an introvert. I'd love to hear at that moment an example. I mean, I'm the kind of guy who starts a party and then goes to my room while the party goes on. Something. It's an opportunity for humor. I joined this club in my church, something I wouldn't normally do, very outgoing of me, but I was just a participant. I was not a leader. I saw this woman. There was no way I was going to talk to her. Like I, I thought she was going to be the person I could spend my life with, but one problem, I'd have to talk to her first. You're notorious amongst the people in the group. They know you're an introvert. They know you're not going to talk to her, so they make an arrangement. So the more you bring in that you're an introvert, or you have trouble meeting people, which invariably, I'm guessing, the speech is not how Toastmasters helped you overcome some of that. I, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, you kind of sort of do. Um, but the, that's, the, that's your theme. I'm this way, and then I'm going to come this way. And when it's your theme, I think it needs to be threaded through more. You need to be reminded of the important obstacle, which if you mentioned it at the beginning, is intro if introversion is not the obstacle in this story, then you're misleading me by mentioning it as like the only sort of negative thing in the beginning. The point that I was ever, the point that I was trying to make throughout the entire speech is that because of Toastmasters, I now have confidence in my life that I did not have before. And the title plays to the idea that if only I had discovered Toastmasters early in life, mm -hmm. things would be different. Right. So it's not necessarily introversion. Introversion and shyness walk the same road, but they're not necessarily the same thing. But if you're talking about your inability to be outgoing, then I'd like it to be prevalent in this opening story. Not just said at the beginning and then left for us to remember that that's drop. Write that down. Introversion and shyness walk the same road, but not necessarily the same. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of thoughts. Number one, I don't know if people are familiar enough with Myers Briggs that you can bring up the. I don't know what my Myers Briggs profile is other than it's an eye. I'm just a solid eye all the time. Since it's a church trip and since you're going to be around people all day, since you're an introvert, can you work in the say the words? Well, now I know what hell on earth is like, or something like that. <laughs> Because, you know, obviously you're putting yourself out there, it's going to be very difficult. And, and if you paint that, but then, you can be the girl. But I could never talk to her, like that's David. And then you wind up on the bus next to her. I don't know where the story goes from there, but I think I'm very interested in that point. Yeah, you go from the story. Okay, two thoughts, Andrew. Did you get your No. Okay, I would change the title then. Because if only told me you didn't get the girl scene. You're tipping off what happened in the story. So don't ever want your title to give away the ending of the movie, so to speak. That's the biggest part, though, is take us into the scene, to today's idea about being an introvert or being shy. You can even have a pain on prom. I, was, I walked into the meeting. There she was. Have you ever seen that person you knew was the one? And immediately I thought, out of my league. <laughs> no way in heck. <laughs> I can ever get somebody like her. My God, she's so beautiful. What is in your head? I mean, again, this is a place to practice you know, to get into Dave's world of acting. Sometimes we have to be actors in our speeches. Don't go overboard. Don't do what I see some people do. I got up one morning and my heart was filled <laughs> because I knew that day I would be reaching for the sky <laughs> going after my dream. No, no, no. Save that for the stage. But let us, put us into that scene. Uh, real quick, before we go any further, um, I want you to do it again, and then would you like to take a break? I mean, we kind of had a pseudo break, or you want to keep going? Keep going. All right. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Restrooms are out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's do let's do that again. Andrew with a new title. 
I have always been an introvert. I'm very shy and I don't really enjoy being around a bunch of people, especially if I don't know you very well. At this point in my life, I've just finished college and I have, even though I would probably consider it kind of hell on earth, I've joined my church's college and career group. On this particular day, we're going on this outing. It's about an hour ride bus trip. And as soon as I arrive at the church, I see her. The most beautiful girl I think I've ever seen in my life. And I want to meet this girl. But due to my shyness, my introversion, I have absolutely no confidence talking to anybody, let alone someone that I find devastatingly attractive. The whole day goes by, and even though I have constantly stared at this woman all day long, apparently, even though I thought I was doing it sneakily, all of my new friends could tell it too. And they worked it out so that on the bus ride home, the only seat available was right next to this beautiful woman. I sat down on the seat, and the whole ride home, I didn't say a word. <laughs> I let my lack of confidence blow the one shot that I had of meeting this beautiful woman who could have been the love of my life. I wish that at an earlier stage of my life, I had joined Toastmasters. Because having been in Toastmasters now for the past four and a half years, it has built inside me a level of confidence that had I had it back then, my life would have been totally different. And it can be different for you too. Toastmasters can develop in you a level of confidence in yourself like you would not believe. I had only been in Toastmasters for just a few months and I had already given a few speeches but I was getting ready to deliver a particular speech on this day. I had prepared myself crazy. I was fully ready to give this speech. I had it written word for word. I had it memorized. And I arrived at the meeting 15 minutes early and I was in my seat ready to go. And I thought, I don't want anything getting in the way of me doing the best possible job on this speech that I can do. I better go use the restroom. <laughs> that way there is nothing that will get in the way of me giving the best speech of my life. So I went to use the facilities, was taking care of business, and my zipper broke. <laughs> what am I going to do? I can't get up in front of my entire club with the whole world to see. I found my mentor, a woman. <laughs> and I told her what happened. And she was like, so she took me to a friend of hers where I got a few safety pins. We got everything wrapped up. <laughs> I got everything wrapped up. And I walked into the meeting just in time to hear the Toastmaster of the say, and our next speaker is Andrew Stevens. All of my confidence went to the floor. What am I gonna do? I was thankfully wearing a polo shirt, so I untucked it and draped it over myself so that everything was okay. And I got up there in front of everybody to give this speech. And about halfway through, everything gone. I stood up there 
and could not remember what was supposed to come next. We videotape our speeches, and I checked it out. I stood there for 28 unbearable seconds of dead silence. And then it all came back. And I was able to finish my speech. Because of Toastmasters, I had the confidence to stand there in front of an entire room full of people and complete that speech. That kind of confidence can be yours too. Consider, are you an introvert? No, you need to raise your hand. <laughs> and then say, I am. Because I think you just come out, and it was like you're reporting, man, an introvert. So something to draw, draw on the audience. Because some of the people there might be an introvert. Are you an introvert? Are you shy? I am. Don't worry, you. Watch the two videos, because the first time you delivered the joke, I can't remember what the joke was, but early on, all about people, people everybody knew you were staring. You, you got a lot more laughs. So watch the way you delivered that. And the other problem I have is the story about the girl in the bus is really disconnected from the Toastmasters experience. And, and one other piece of advice, you know, in case your wife would ever see it, <laughs> be careful on saying you missed out on the love of your life. <laughs> Postmaster's advice. That has everything to do with it. But, 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 and, and in fact, it is Toastmaster's advice because if I'm thinking it, some of your audience is thinking, really? The dude's got a wedding ring? He thinks he missed out on the love of his life. Mm -hmm. So you, you might want to work that a little bit. Unless we find out you married her at the end, but that's so. well, <laughs> no. So, or you can great. say you thought she was the woman. There that, that's what there I meant to say. That's at that right time, there. I, I <laughs> thought it she was just for and that. Question. I'm very nervous. Did you hear what he just said? He's nervous up here. To make you nervous. So I want you to go back in there and do and try that dialogue in your head when you describe the scene in the first time. Again, it's the first time you can tell the same advice. The pause after you said 28 seconds. Oh, yeah. it's like, yeah. I'm even wondering if you need to say 28 seconds. I stood up there. And this went on for 28 of the longest seconds of my life. It felt like 28 years. <laughs> Did anybody relate to that? Yeah. I did. You just took me back to 2003 when I was in a regional speech contest in Toronto, Canada and forgot my speech. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I also, when I was in eighth grade, sat next to a girl all day that I really thought was cute and didn't say a word to her. So I was there and created so much pain. <laughs> the uh, opportunity to build contrast again is in the story of the girl on the bus. I couldn't believe it. they had arranged it. I didn't even realize that the only seat left was going to be next to her. And I sat down so excited and spent the entire ride staring forward and not saying I'm ready. <laughs> we got a gasp from people when they heard that too, but you can even increase the distance between where your head was and the reality of the situation. And really tell you people to be surprising. Well, you, you, were coming, you did the pause after telling us about the 20th century. You did the pause sitting next to it. It was like that bus ride all over again. There yes. you go. Yes. Oh, yes. There is my picture. There is my picture. Very nice. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. I want to add something to the context of that in part of the feedback. She needs a name. Sarah. So I. I <laughs> Sarah can't be all bad. I'm the father of three daughters, and I and it's 
painful for me to hear someone talk about the only thing he saw was a beautiful woman, and he only referred to her as beautiful woman, this beautiful woman. She has a name. She's a person. Right. And that, that, that really, that hits me hard. She was engaging. She had a pretty laugh, you know, an engaging laugh, or something about her other than her appearance is what you're saying. That, she needs to have a name. Her. Okay, what about this? Or I never got her name. I need to know. That, that's, that's what I'm saying. You know what her name was? Neither do I. I wouldn't talk to her. Yeah, I quit the club. I never went back. 99% of the time. I changed religions. Names. <laughs> names humanize characters. But in this case, not knowing actually builds to his message. If, I, if only I had done that. I didn't even know her name. Can you believe? Bring him a great point, though. Thank you. Brown's a little red and girl never had a name either. <laughs> I'm asking for opinion from the three of you because when, when he first got up there, and I know a lot of introverts, and it's very difficult for this to, to go like this. I commend him for being able to get up and do that. But if by design he came up here and had no qualities of a Toastmaster, and he was the legitimate introvert that he was back at the time when he was on the bus. And then, after all, this story is about how Toastmasters will help bring you out of all that. What if he had a transformation that took place? And when he said the what if, it was, now this is what Toastmasters has done. And he starts to exude all the qualities of a, of a speaker that has been trained and ingrained in him through years of Toastmasters. I mean, I'm just thinking almost like opening up his chest and there's a big S there because now he's, you know, the super guy. But I hurt for him when he first came up because I was there. I was living that introversion of not being able to talk to the woman. But then that contrast that you guys are talking about, if he actually became the guy that he wanted to be and harkened back to, I would have done this, I would have done that. Because today I'm, that contrast, I'm just. Yeah, that's a good point. I talked about, and Phil brought up the timeline. This is the past. Mm -hmm present, future. There's another concept that my friend Darren LaCroix taught teaches. It's called the hologram. If you go back, it's a three-dimensional effect. So take the advice that I gave you, Andrew. I should just let them do it. <laughs> I had you come up here at the beginning. That's a great point. You could start this back here away. I'm an introvert. I was afraid of all this. And it's almost like you're going diagonally through the history of your story. And I, and I end up right up here Toastmasters, I'm super bad. <laughs> you feel more confident because placement on the stage does send a message to the audience. Very and good point. Your speech that you came super prepared for, you're ready to go, and then you think, I have to go to the bathroom, my fly breaks, and all of a sudden, my confidence is shot. I wish I was anywhere but Toastmasters that day, and then you would draw to the mm -hmm. distant, undercontinent location on the stage. Your coach, to, to the point, or I'm sorry, your name's David. 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 David, your coach has that name. If she's that important to you, you got to know who she is. That could be the way, depending on the name, you know, it's Cindy or something, that could be a way to introduce the fact. And there was my mentor, Cindy. And now everybody realizes, oh, wow, your mentor's a woman, so yeah. And, and, and by the way, that whole that whole sequence was hilarious. The whole yeah. broke your zipper and then had to tell your mentor, and it turns out your mentor's a woman, and, and, and the safety pins. That story it drew me in. I'm laughing. Yeah, and this is again, uh, you don't need as many words. David, feel free to chime in. How could this be visually be like? <laughs> Careful. <laughs> um, Cindy. Uh, <laughs> it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different speed. There's a lot of unspoken that can go on there to help us feel your video. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was going to go down that same path, and as was just mentioned, you know, it's, it's interesting for someone who shares being an introvert and some of the challenges with that was able to do so masterfully and brilliantly in that it was humorous. I thought his statement that he joined the church group and it was hell on earth. There's some, certainly an oxymoron with that statement. 
in and of itself. And to be able to expand on that, I just I thought that sharing something that's very much a part of him, but being able to do so in a way that was humorous but not over the top was very well done. Is this helping? Would you like to have this at future events? Yeah. Yeah. It's on film. <laughs> <laughs> And, and don't you like the bigger room? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got a free resource to offer everyone. This is a, a new report called Seven Biggest Storytelling Mistakes. If you'd like to sign up for it, we'll have this around. Just give us your name and your email address. This is not for sale. It is a private list. No obligation. No strings attached. Uh, we'll pass that on. Yes, ma'am. I'll ask a question. What do you advise for people that bring so much emotion to their story they have a hard time telling it without breaking down? Uh, do you have a question? If you have so much emotion for your story to break down, you're not ready to tell it. Never use the stage for therapy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm speaking as a doctor. <laughs> this is not the place for that. You've got to get through it. A, a, a few tears are okay, but not if you're breaking down. Quick story, I had the great honor and privilege of coaching Anthony Munoz for his 10X talk a couple years ago. We would go through these rehearsals and he was always getting stuck in this one part and I thought he just is not remembering that part of the story. Flash forward to the day of the event. He's in front of 800 people. He's giving his speech and wouldn't you know, he freezes again at that key point where he's been stumbling. This time the pause going on and on and on. Said, Anthony, what's going on? And he looked at the audience and said, please forgive me. This is just really emotional for me right now. Huge ovation. Because in that moment, he stopped being Anthony Menos, the legendary football player, icon of Cincinnati. He was just like us. The emotion is perfectly fine. We want it in your speech. We just don't break it down. It's too soon. My emotional story happened more than 30 years ago, but when I retold it, I was there in the moment. Could you feel it? Yeah. 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 That's reliving a story rather than retelling. We all want to get to that point of our story. We should have pointed that out. That was very good. I once listened to an interview with the person who's the artistic director at Moth, which is a very popular, you know, it's storytelling <coughs> platform that based in New York. This woman, Catherine Burns, said something about this idea of people speaking about difficult topics. And she talked about how they coach their storytellers to speak about, it's okay to speak about scars, but not about wounds. You need perspective. The idea of not having perspective yet is like going up on stage and getting therapy. It's probably useful for the speaker, but not very useful for the audience and feels very uncomfortable. If you have perspective and can speak from it from 20 years later, or maybe not even that long necessarily, but if you've, the wound has had a chance to heal and you've come to grips with what it is you've learned from that experience, that's the great time to tell it. That's when you have something to share with us, the whole what's in it for me thing. Otherwise, it's just about you. Any more volunteers? Got that hand halfway up. That's a good one. Introduction yes. to a more of an inspirational career talk. So here's with the uh, title. Mm -hmm. Three P's. Three P's for your career. Here's Lisa. I wish you could have been there on the stage with me receiving my 2016 RD Research Fellow Award from the Scott Company. 
because of the Toastmaster, I wasn't even able to give a short, brief thank you to all the members in my group. Because if they are not there, the teamwork, I would not have received that award. Although I've been with Scott for the past 22 years. Reflecting back to my career, I want to share with you three keys and three turning points in my life that make me who I am today. Right. Just one real quick one. Yeah. The, you're making it clear that without Toastmasters, you wouldn't have been able to graciously receive this award, which is great. That tells me something about where the story is going. The mention of teamwork and the fact that it wasn't like your award by yourself got in the way of my understanding okay. that. I mean, that's very gracious of you to recognize that, and that's probably what you said when you got up there to speak, but is confusing because this is about you being unable to speak mm -hmm. and now it sounds almost like you don't feel worthy of the award which okay. is a different story but okay. probably would feel worthy. Okay. Anyway, so okay. just watch out about misleading us. Oh. My, thought, uh, yeah. my, thought, my thought on it was specific is memorable so I wish you could have been there with me on the stage at the Grand Ballroom in Chicago, Illinois. Okay. And if you want to mention your team at that point you can say in the audience, there were 500 people, including 10, 10 members of my team. Can you give me some specific, memorable, okay. where location, how okay. many of those kind of, any specifics will help lock you to memory. Okay. Lisa, what were your emotions in that moment? Proud. And really, actually I was, so what I continue on was, thank you, the organizer for inviting me and to share with them and the three teams. So I was very proud to be able to do that. And by the way, I actually, I just realized I put the Toastmaster in the front. In that particular moment, I did not have that. It was later in my speech. Did you feel like something was missing? Yes. I okay. Now, would that be lead in, to Dave's point, would that lead into the main part of the speech though? Yes. Okay, so the so it was a forty-five minutes PowerPoint presentation. So when I was talking about standing on the stage when they were with me, I had my trophy on the PowerPoint, and then the next thing I do was taking them into the three keys. So today, in the next forty-five minutes, you will hear. Passion, preparedness, and persistence that made my career to today. And then I started talking about the, my life story okay. from when I come to the U.S. I am feeling a little disconnect between okay. the opening of feeling that something's missing versus okay. here are the three keys. Okay. Are you giving the same thing? I, well, I'm curious who the audience is. Okay, the audience were they were postdoc graduate student, undergraduate student. So he's talking to them about my career path. A path that is in front of them, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So for the future for them, because they are at the undergraduate. I would like a little more bridge between that introduction and you're talking about the three Ps that okay. specifically says uh -huh. my career what, at the, what, when I was where you are now, uh -huh. I couldn't necessarily see how I was going to get to where I am today. Okay. But I got here, and I want to help you along the way. Okay. Something yeah. like that. I do not have that in there. Okay. Yeah, because then I just jump into my presentation. Right. So that's a PowerPoint presentation, and I go directly into my mm -hmm. when I when I was undergraduate student, and then you could just to relate to where they are, and naive and so on and so on. Right. And then, then. Then I run into my first turning point of my life, and that's when I was young, I was really very good at math. But when I take my college examination, college entrance examination, 
which is the education system that when I was in Taiwan, I did poorly in my math. So I ended up admitted to the second best university, which is National Normal Taiwan University. Little did I know that's my first turning point. Because after graduation, I was assigned to teach in a middle school. And that's where I met my husband in the, in the future. So if I didn't have the first turning point, that would never happen. And then the point there will be, you never know what is going to happen to you in your life. So be open and accepted, but be prepared. And then I move on. I'm going to stop you there. That's really good. Always bring up that point. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of callbacks. Okay. If and this would not happen at your events, but if for some reason somebody was speaking before you talking about being shy, meeting a woman yeah. who he thought was beautiful, said, you know what, I didn't know, but someday I was going to meet my husband. You better believe oh, I talked to him. <laughs> <laughs> Which did not happen, but he did pick me up. <laughs> Not getting into that first university and only getting into the second best university in Taiwan. This is an anecdote from your life. I'm not convinced that it was a turning point unless you tell me that you were disappointed. Because the lesson that you say you're delivering as part of this story is you don't know where your life is going to be. And I don't think anybody doesn't know that. However, what you're trying to tell them is disappointments and setbacks are a natural part of life. But, but they don't have to define you. Yeah. You carry on and you find the person that you, et cetera, et cetera. I wasn't the only one disappointed. My father was extremely disappointed because he always thought I'm the genius in the house. <laughs> So when I was teaching in this, I'm going to stop. I want to go back to today's point. We'll go okay. back to the story okay. where you didn't get accepted. We need to. And I, I agree with David. We need to heal that. Okay. What was that? And add your father's feedback to that. Yeah, my father's feedback. Actually, just came back. I, I think I can turn it on. So I was teaching in this middle school. Imagine that there's tables for the teachers. So we all connected. So I was sitting in this table. My future husband was sitting in the back of the next room. So one day he just told me after we become very friendly to each other, he said, I always stare at you, the head of your head. And I was so cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I truly dressed up. I was the same size as one. <laughs> but I was cute. So he said, I always disappear at the lunch time. And then I came back must be created a curious from him because I went home. The school was only two minutes walking distance from me. So one day he walked me home and my father saw me <coughs> from a distance. So I, after I got back to the house, my father said, you two look alike. Maybe this is what meant to be. Because eventually we did that. But that's, I think that helped out with that's the really good, disappointment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, well, right, no, 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 no. But I, the whole, my father was disappointed, was great. Nobody wants to disappoint their parents. 
So that's good. And then when you wrap it, you come back to the, the, the your future husband, which give him his, you can tell us his name too. Yes, it helps oh, him. it's Jim. Everybody knows my husband too. And maybe the whole reaction is, I do look back to your hair, and there, he says, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. oh, dialogue. Okay. And, and so you show us, yeah. And then, when we go back to this, Lisa, because we're, we're going to wrap up here. Yes. I, I still want to see, when you don't get accepted to the first university, uh -huh. I want to see thing. your disappointment and hear your thoughts to Lisa. You're the genius of the family. <laughs> if you can set up that disappointment to what Dave said earlier, now when he comes to you and says, Jim, it's a pretty good couple. There's contrast. There. Okay. Your yes. father now sees the value of you not getting accepted to him. Yeah. I still remember that day. My father told me when he looked at the, my university thing. You were so good at math. I was first praised when I was in my sixth grade in my school out of 2,000 kids in my class. And your math was really good. What happened in math? Is that, is that it? Yes. Is that what we're looking yes. for right there? Yes. What happened? <laughs> yeah, he truly asked me that. What happened? I <laughs> I should that's say, it, right that's, it. That's, that's it. That's it. See, so don't tell it. us you're disappointed or someone was disappointed. Show us. Okay. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> Is that what every kid says? Yeah. Why did you do that? I don't know. Why did you do that? It's a very powerful moment, too, when the father is looking at these grades. I would hate to hear you dilute it with too many okay. words. Okay. My dad looked at the grades, and he looked at me, and he said, Lisa, what happened? Boom, oh, right? You bring up sixth grade and how good it's just, yeah. it sort of slows that moment down. Oh, okay, so don't even do that. Okay. Keep it down. All right. Does this help, Lisa? Yes, very right. helpful. Let's give her a hand. Right, we need to begin to wrap up. I want to thank everyone for being here today. Hopefully, you got a lot of See, the key is not just for the person in front of the room, we wanted this to be inspirational and educational for everyone here. So real quick, what are some ideas you picked up that you can go use in your very next speech? Yes, Carl. Don't keep moving when I'm trying to describe two conversations. Absolutely. Hit it. Mm -hmm. Stand still because it robs you of energy. Mm -hmm. What else? But on the contrast, as far as moving around on the stage, I didn't realize you know, there's a past, present, future, and mm -hmm. when you're feeling less confident, maybe go to the back. And it's subconscious, but it's there. Yeah. People don't even necessarily know it when they're watching you, but they feel it when it works. Yes. I took this as a, book, as a way that um, we can change or enhance how we do evaluations in our club. With this kind of feedback, the sort of interactive element, you can take the traditional postmaster feedback model and inject more power into it. I, I know they said before, but dialogue. I, mean, I want to narrate my speeches, and I know I can get back and forth dialogue. And also, Phil made a great point about let the speech become longer if it is, and then find out where the good stuff is. If it's dissected, I'm never thought about doing that. That's a great idea. Throw it all out there, and then start to chip. Yeah. It was a good point about naming your characters in your stories, because that makes them more real. And instead of saying that my mentor was a woman, which made the, the situation more awkward, all I would have had to do is say, I went and sought out my mentor, Natalina. <laughs> and that would have immediate, I mean, that would have gotten more comedic effect than me mentioning the fact that my mentor is a woman. Yes, sometimes we don't give our audience credit enough for being pretty smart. So as soon as you say a woman's name, we're going to fill in the blank and say, oh my gosh, you poor thing. <laughs> you got to watch out for naming too many of your characters. When you give a character a name, you're basically telling your audience this character is important. Take note. They're coming back. They're part of this moment. If you name everybody, it suddenly becomes, which one was that? And mm -hmm. why was that person important? Was that your brother? So the important. Just the people who 
taught the lesson or were involved in the humor to build that up. Yes, Jacob. The place you don't want to go is the place you may have to go. The place you don't want to go. This year I've been working on a story about a time of my life I didn't want to share. And every time I've told it, somebody came up to me and said, you were talking to me today. It's like, oh, Greg was right. <laughs> okay, I don't like to share it, but there it is. Yes, David. I like the way that the three of you interact. Seeing that they're the three separate people with totally different opinions on the speech is really helpful. Mm -hmm. You'd never guess we can't stand each other. <laughs> <laughs> These are very good friends of mine, and this is the other beauty of Toastmasters, the friendships you create. And when we put this together, I thought, we, we didn't want three people all standing up here saying the same thing. And we got a humorist, an actor, and some dude in a costume. <laughs> In a, a summary kind of way, this is all showing just how important evaluation is as a skill. And rehearsal is a mini practice. Just what's amazing to me is if you're world champion of public speaking, you can't come back again and compete in the contest because you've already clarified a lot of things in your mind. And a, as a, as a speaker, that's what I'm working on, to get clarity, what an audience needs. And I need to rehearse, I need to practice. If your club culture is no practice beforehand, you're losing out. Absolutely. And I want to piggyback on that. The greatest tool that you have for the fastest growth is those two devices right back there. Record yourself. Now, the first time Darren LaCroix suggested to me to do this, I said, Darren, I really, I don't like listening to myself. I really don't like watching myself. And he said, really? It's really too bad. Well, guess what? We had to listen. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, right, now I would tell you it is painful the first couple of times, but I promise you, when you get feedback, and then you go back and watch a video, for example, Dave might have said to you, you know what, Donnie, your pauses, you really need to stretch your pauses. And Donnie, you're thinking, are you kidding? I, I pause for yeah, four or five seconds. The video never lies. <laughs> <laughs> you go back and watch, it's like a half second. It's like, I see now what he means. The evaluation takes on a deeper meaning to you. I think we're getting the crook shame. One more question, and <clears throat> yes. Lisa Lee challenged me. I gave a speech and had a group evaluation. She says, two days later, you need to give this speech. There's an opening, go give it. It was one of the best experiences in the topic, and we don't give the same speech in that time. Uh, and so in our club, we talked about, take one of your first five speeches and repeat it with the evaluation you have somewhere in the next month. One of the reasons why we do it in contest, but we never do it. Right. But I like to encourage people to do contests, even if they don't feel competitive, because opportunities like that exist. We always want to do it. I remember when I first joined, I'm going to repeat a speech. I never did it until I was in a contest and I had an opportunity to do it. And it is a great experience. Ran this over. This piece of advice I just heard about uh, the late Glenn Fry, member of the band The Eagles, was supposedly said that every time they went out on tour, before they would play that first gig, they had to do their set list perfectly 100 times in a row before they would go on stage. You want to be the best? Practice. With that, thank you for being here.